to this yet another SNBN session. For those who are joining here and also for those joining from Singapore and other places, I express my heartfelt welcome to this Dharma sharing and the reflection. So before we move on to the actual subject matter of this sharing, let's sit quietly for a few minutes, settling our mind and body. Let's now take a few minutes in visualizing the merit field in the space of our oneself. Visualize the presence of Shakyamuni Buddha, the world honored one, radiant with the lights emanating from his body. all rooted in his full consummate achievement of infinite love, compassion, wisdom, all of the practices of the Paramitas having fully perfected. Thus becoming a merit field For all of us to genuine extensive merit by just reflecting on his qualities that he achieved through his own efforts, extending so many eons, motivated by the soul, attitude, thought of benefiting others in the truest sense of the word. This way, while we think of the qualities of the Buddha, particularly his inner mental qualities, consummate achievements, we 
reflecting on those qualities, let these reflections generate a sense of awe, oh, sense of reverence. And then reflecting on how Buddha began with his motivation followed by practices spanning all those countless eons. All the efforts, hardships that he had to undergo now he stood, stood firm in his motivation and pursued the path, figured out the way out of samsara, not just samsara, but even further beyond that, completely overcoming the subtle stains of afflictions, thus landing himself in a state of full awakening. Thinking of those aspects of his path. Together with his continued enlightened activities that is benefiting sentient beings all over. Thinking along these lines, see if we could generate a sense of Admiration, reverence, think of the Buddha being surrounded by his disciples, lineage gurus, lineage masters of all traditions, after this present day. Think of their kindness. their wisdom, their skillfulness. Thus filling us with a sense of awe, appreciation, reverence and admiration. And also filling us with a sense of gratitude. And then think of ourselves being surrounded by fellow sentient beings, all in human form, so that we would have the convenience of including them in our visualization that we carry out together, yet at the same time undergoing their own respective sufferings, predicaments, both unique and common, common to samsari existence. How in the midst of all this confusion, ignorance, we directly and indirectly extend our helping hands in all different ways, in all different forms, constantly helping each other. Thinking along these lines, see if we could generate a sense of affinity based on our, based on our common humanity, our common aspirations for happiness and freedom from suffering. Let that sense of affinity grow into a sense of empathy. Passion, love, equanimity, these growing into great compassion, great loving kindness, great equanimity, great empathetic joy, they in turn generating bodhicitta, a firm determination imbued with clarity of 
direction towards full awakening. For we see that to be the most. capable state of being of benefit to all sentient beings in the truest sense of the word. With these cultivations we will say the homage to Shakyamuni Buddha together while saying these lines also try to come up with a heartfelt sense of what these words are saying and let them kind of mold our mind into this consummate spirit of bodhicitta. Let's stay for a while in this mode, mental mode of bodhicitta, aspiring to attain full awakening for the sake of all sentient beings. Not just think of it, that's not just think of this mindset, but rather mold one's own mind into this form. Where you have the aim of achieving full awakening oneself. for the sole purpose of benefiting all sentient beings. By way of cultivating a more induced motivation for this session, where you think of the rational behind cultivating bodhicitta, making a big fuss about it. Why that is the sole path that all the Buddhas took, how this led them to a state of full awakening, does not, not, does not only themselves are freed from all shortcomings whatsoever, but at the same time equip them with the capacity with the wisdom, with the caring mind, compassion and loving kindness, to be, at least from their part, fully able to benefit all sentient beings, fully facilitated, fully equipped. This all brings us home to our predicament in samsaric existence of how what we wish for and what we get. There's a mismatch. How, in respect of our differences on a superficial level, we all share in this deep seated wish for happiness and joy. and freedom from suffering. Yet, despite this shared commonality, despite the fact that everything that we do is in a way driven by this aspiration, which is rightful, rational, fundamental, universal, 
justified. Nonetheless, something goes wrong. Soon after, we make efforts in what we think might bring about this fulfilment. Yet we are far from achieving any lasting joy, peace, happiness. Instead, everything, almost everything that we do. Particularly those that we do unawares, unintentional, unconscious, but even among so much of what we do consciously, thinkingly, thoughtfully, supposedly thoughtfully, smartly, all lend us into more suffering. This is a clear indication that there is something wrong with how we pursue. This quest for justified, rightful, aim of happiness, freedom from suffering. That's the reason why in Buddhism, broadly speaking, we speak of ignorance, misunderstanding, as the cause of sufferings as the cause of the unwanted sufferings, as the cause of our failure in achieving happiness that we so consistently, persistently seek, yet find ourselves so far And together with this, the emphasis on wisdom in Buddhism, like we all recall Shantideva's opening stanza in the ninth chapter on wisdom, he summarizes this by saying everything that Buddha taught. All boils down to it eventually. Understanding, figuring out, and generating, internalizing this wisdom of understanding the reality. It's quite shocking to know what this wisdom that is claimed to have the key to our lasting happiness is said to be about, about real understanding the reality. It doesn't entail us to make something new, invent something new, but see what is there already as it is. So that means we are so ignorant of what, what the reality up front is. Yes, in Buddhism, but at least from the Tibetan approach, just as with most of the difficult topics in Buddhism, it presents a step-by-step -step approach to understanding it in its full scope. So is the case with either identifying ignorance, the so-called ignorance, or that of identifying and establishing what that wisdom would be that will completely overcome this ignorance. But ultimately, this wisdom is supposed to be about the wisdom of understanding 
the ultimate mode of existence of things. Not just about the law of causality, of course they are important, but ultimately it all comes down to understanding the reality as it is, ultimate reality, the fundamental ultimate reality. So we have got to think of why is this called ultimate, in what sense this understanding amounts to understanding the ultimate, fundamental mode of existence of things. In what ways that state of being is ultimate, fundamental. So, as human beings in general, particularly those. Those human lives facilitated by the great fortune and opportunities to pursue Dharma practice. Which, from among all types of sentient beings, is present only among the human beings. Yes, relatively, in general, God realms, rebirth in the celestial realms is also considered fortunate. But in general, human rebirth present with all this fortune, the opportunity is considered very rare, and very precious. Because of this link, to the wisdom of understanding ultimate reality, holding the key to our prospect, to bloom, to our prospect, to improve. Thus in the prayer that we just said, it says, among the qualities of the Buddha, it calls on pain as the teacher of the gods and humans. Because those are the only viable vessels by which they could make stride in their quest for joy and happiness by understanding the path shown by the Buddha. Thus, every time, every moment of our being alive, we cannot effort to overlook this aspect of our great fortune and ever be wondering about how best to use it. And that equally applies here at this session, at this moment. Not just our life in general, not just the coming few years, months, but more particularly, to be very practical in making most of this opportunity we have to rise up to the occasion of the real present moment. And thus, it becomes imperative that we use this opportunity in the best possible way. And the surest way we can make good use of this is by coming up with cultivating a proper motivation. And here, no motivation excels bodhicitta, the expansive heart that goes to every one, without exception. And it's smart enough to choose nothing short of full awakening. Grounded on our efforts and our realizations, understanding of how, given the nature of our mind, in all different aspects, be that of its clear light nature, of its being undefiled in its very core nature, be that in its
ever-present nature of being, thoroughly, dependently related with nothing intrinsically existent, which in which, which in which case it would be a stumbling block with no prospect of change to occur, but that's not the case. And on top of that, all of the afflictions, both manifest and their latent states, together with their very subtle instincts, they are all rooted in, in, in ignorance, which is totally misconstruing the reality, and thus how deep-seated it may be, it nonetheless always leaves the room for it to be exposed, for it to be weakened, undermined, overcome. Thus, thinking along all these lines, be even more induced to make the most of this opportunity of this life in general, of any or of our remaining years, more particularly of this very session. So that everything that we do, that we hear, that we share, that we reflect on, becomes conjoined with this marvelous motivation. So let's once again stay in a state of bodhicitta, aspiring to attain full awakening for the sake of all sentient beings, for all the reasons that we can think of. May this session together contribute to us, making us closer to realizing it for the sake of all sentient beings. I want to speak a little bit on this motivation thing, and particularly the motivation of bodhicitta. Just the common sense can also make us understand how such a mind, such such a mentality of bodhicitta can generate immense, immense merit. We may think of merits in so many different ways, but when we speak of bodhicitta, it extends to all sentient beings, irrespective, doesn't discriminate among them. And the reason to care for them, to have a sense of concern over them, is also due to our shared commonality, as well as our dependence, as well as rooted in a strong sense of gratitude all the benefits that they bring, either with an intentional kind heart or not, irrespective of that. It's just a matter of ourselves being open to the prospects. If we are, then no matter whatever the sentient beings may be going through, may be 
turning out to be on the surface, we can always transform it into something of immense value. And thus, when we do anything irrespective, with such an expensive mind, you can see how the act itself becomes so special in being touched with such a marvelous mindset, such a marvelous attitude. And then if we could complement it with understanding, deep understanding, but not, then it would even seem very strongly grounded in reality. And to that extent, the depth of it also contributes to the marvelous nature of it. So not just the expensiveness, but even the depth, the profundity of it. And then to the level we approach it sincerely, whatever level of sincerity, whatever level of heartfelt concern we bring into it, it makes that action, that moment, that event, that occasion, much more powerful. So if we were to do anything every time with this renewed sense of bodhicitta, not only the strength of bodhicitta will build up over time, but every step that we make, every step that we take, every action that we take, particularly if we do cultivate bodhicitta thrice, four, four times, five times a day, six times in the case of six sex in yoga, practitioners, what not. And here we do that even more than that, just about every coming together we generate bodhicitta. So there is this more prospect of how the influence of the power of the force of the bodhicitta generated beforehand would be sustained until the next one we renew it. So it's like a 24 hour. We are immersed in bodhicitta. So that part we have to acknowledge, we have to remember and feel even more enthused in adding strength to that, adding enthusiasm to that. So then everything that we do, we can be assured that yes, not only we are doing it in a virtuous mental state, but also in a very significant way, something that cannot be excelled in Bodhicharvatara by Shantideva. He says that Keva Tumar Rakunsevai Tuana Kitini Pembersi. For eons, Buddhas have considered what would be the best to benefit sentient beings. All they came to is bodhicitta. With bodhicitta rooted in great compassion, all the rest of the practices unfolds, including seeking wisdom, skillfulness, all of the perfections, all of them spring from that. Particularly bodhicitta gives a very clear direction to great compassion. Of course, great compassion is the root out which bodhicitta came, but with bodhicitta, then one may have now be gained a very clear direction. So, I wanted to dwell on that to remind ourselves of the significance of this and try to do so, not just as a motion of doing it, but rather 
with their heartfelt sins to the extent possible, even if it may be a contrived one for the time being. But within the contrived states of bodhicitta, there can be degrees of strength, rootedness, clarity, all of that. And that eventually becomes a powerful, genuine, spontaneous bodhicitta. So with that, we'll pick up from where we left last time. Oh yeah, it is. Yes, it is. We are on page 286, right? Is it? I think so. Yeah, before we move on to uh, new lines, not new paragraphs, new lines. <laughs> because we were going line by line. Actually, when we are reading text, we have no other choice but go line by line, word by word. But we have been doing it quite slowly. So before moving on and bringing new things, I wanted to comment on what we discussed last time a little bit. One thing that I brought up was that things, when investigated upon, cannot be found, not just in the ultimate sense, but also conventional sense. <laughs> so usually we, see, we, think, we say things exist conventionally. So that means they should be findable in the conventional world. And they are not only findable, they affect the matter. But when searched upon, when investig when searched upon, even in the face of a thing, when we are not content with that and we search for that, then even if that mode of search doesn't amount to searching in the ultimate sense, which means it will be still within the conventional realm still things cannot be found. In other ways, it's saying that there's a way of finding, looking for things that we cannot end up finding things, yet still not amount to that not finding, becoming an understandable emptiness. So, which is to say that when we look, when we investigate, when we have a book in front, and we say this is a book, and we are not content and we try to look into the pages and whatnot, there's no way we can find book anywhere. That finding, that investigation from what I understand, of course I have a scriptural reference in Chandrakirti's text, entering the middle way. So that kind of a search, searching for things and not finding it, is not it. That's not quite it. <laughs> so that's important to understand because usually when we explain emptiness, even in the scriptures, including including uh, Shantideva's text, including Nagarjuna's Text and also in Sutra, where it speaks of how beings or person is not findable when searched among its composite elements. Unless we see the context properly on the face of it, at least with, within that selected uh, portion, it will look like it's searching for things in the way I described and making a big deal about not finding it. But that unfindability is not that a big deal, just about anyone can figure out. So in the yeah, particular, first let me give the reference from the entering to middle way by Chandragitti 
where he sits. Then in the need of Jigdendo, number 22, pure Mimeji. So we speak of analyzing things, looking for things in seven modes of investigation, or five modes of investigation, as we find in the fundamental treatises of Nagarjuna. And two additional modes have been added, or approaches of angles have been added by Chandrakirti himself. And thus speak of the seven approaches, seven angles of investigation. It says that no matter how you approach, or no matter which way you approach, conventionally or ultimately, uh, in probing into things through these seven angles of investigation, you're not going to find. So that's that's the indication where it speaks of searching, investigating into things, even within the realm of a conventional things cannot be found. So it is not selective. It's not saying that this thing cannot be found conventionally when such a bond. This thing can be found when such a bond conventionally. It's again universal. Yet at the same time, that kind of not finding is not landing on emptiness. So this is in, in, important to understand so that we could now understand what one way is not understanding or not finding emptiness. Just as uh, Thomas Edison, was it, was it Thomas Edison who said that he, he, he seemed to have made several mistakes in inventing electricity. Some even count to 6,000 something, 6,000 errors. It's quite imaginable because for the first time someone is bringing about such a big revolutionary invention. So he said to have commented on his failure, so-called failures, saying that I have found out 6,000 ways to avoid. <laughs> so he, he saw his mistakes, not as mistakes, but as as indications of avoid, as indications of steps towards finding things, so that whenever he made a mistake, he is, he kind of counted them as, as, a, as a way to avoid and keep, keep avoiding all this, and amounted to some 6,000 things, and eventually he landed to uh, inventing electricity. So likewise, with this kind of a uh, position, then we at least have one thing to avoid in mistaking emptiness. And in the Tibetan texts, we usually call this Takdun Tena Minyeba Tongyi Mai. Not finding things upon investigating the... Upon not Takdun Tena Minyeba, not finding upon... while not finding When we searched, when we search for the basis of in imputation, is not equal to understanding emptiness. But at the same time, there is an interesting thing in the in the Vaibhashika, the very initial Buddhist tenet. They speak of two truths, and where they speak of say in the case of a golden pot, the gold aspect of that is ultimate truth, ultimate reality. And the pot, part of that, is a relative, conventional reality. And how they make this distinction is, to say they, they say that if you break the pot, the pot is no more there, but the gold is still there in every piece of it. So because 
on the basis on that basis they make this distinction between ultimate truth and relative truth and there it always seems like yes they they could figure out that yes from breaking the pot the pot is no more there but the gold still lingers on and and that is very similar to this 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 way of looking for things though conventionally but still be faced with the fact that it is unfundable despite our very assured sense that it is there so that's what i was referring to as searching for something or investigating something and landing into not finding it yet still not quite there in not finding it ultimately so then the question arises what does not finding in the ultimate sense means because if you search things ultimately in the ultimate sense then the unfindability is finding the unfindable seeing the unseen or or not seeing the noble not seeing so in this regard i was struck by the bodhisattva katra sutra when we were studying it uh, online through from kishi shitakela where this is where there is this statement because th- i mean i cannot uh, go to it verbatim but what it runs uh, runs like and it, it does it in a frequent way is is that because because form is not form i'm just making up here yeah. because form is not form therefore it is called form the need for it to be called form is because there is no intrinsic form and that's the only way by which form can be form because intrinsically it is not there because if it were to be intrinsically form then there would be no need for us to call it form anyway <laughs> so like was here what it let me bring up the problem here also so that's why in the at least in the geluk geluk scriptures particularly in the writings of songkhapa it's very clear and particularly his two disciples that in the writings of the three of them it's very clear that uh, they warn us saying that when we speak of emptiness we are not speaking of form being empty of form rather form being empty of an intrinsic form form being in, form being empty of inherent existence or form being empty of inherently existent form not form being empty of form so that's why yet at the same time that kind of a emptiness still amounts to what in the scriptures say or what the, what in the scriptures hint at that the empty empty the emptiness that we understand has to amount to things being self empty not empty of empty of something else so we make a big distinction big deal about rang tong and shen tong self empty and other empty for for lack of a better term self empty but at the same time it is not quite self empty in the sense of form being empty of form but at the same time not other empty in that the emptiness of form is form being empty of something else like a cup or form being empty of 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 feeling or form being empty of some other phenomena it's neither that no at the same time it is not 
form being empty of form, yet at the same time, uh, compared with what would be form being empty of something else, it is still form being empty, form being self-empty, but not quite form being empty of form. So they make this point very strongly, because otherwise, because of the risk that we might settle on a very, very cheap thing in our search for emptiness. <laughs> Yet at the same time, this holds a danger. By, by saying that the form is not empty, we are not here to uh, refute the formness of the form, but rather form being inherently existent or an inherently existent form then there is the danger of keeping our usual sense of form as it is, and then thinking of or looking for something on top of it as the object of refutation. That's why this this warning, that this alarm or this warning that was sounded by Changyar Rupitaji in his text on the Guru Amma Wenzi, recognizing the mother, where he says that that if we still retain the, the amorphous concept of things being what they are, which appears to us as it is, and then try to look for something additional, such as a horn like that, on that thing as being the object of reputation, then we are not touching at our ignorance, at our basic conception of the inherent self. Yet at the same time, it has to be approached in such a way that you do not undermine the conventionality of it, of the form, yet at the same time, not end up retaining the status quo and then look for something else to be brought in additionally so that it could be then rejected, so that it could be then refuted. So, between these statements, one could very clearly see the, the danger of either going one extreme or to the other extreme. So anyway, uh, my main point was uh, making this case of how even conventionally when things are uh, investigated upon, they could not be found, yet at the same time, that find, not finding is not the final not finding. Yet, in, that it is not the final non-self or non-form, non-feeling, etc. So in this regard, I wanted to share something. In this regard, One thing that seems to be helpful, at least to me, I may be completely off the mark, but let me propose it here. Of course, with, with, with my backing in the scriptures, in the way I read it, <laughs> is that everything without exception is like an emergent property, is like an emergent thing. So when you speak of, in science, they speak of water being an emergent property, water being an emergent property, emerging from two different atoms, H2O, right? From that comes water. Although we call the water itself uh, H2O, but in terms of its components, the elements are not the water, and the water is an emergent. Something that comes out of two different things, 
coming into a new thing. So by extension, from a Buddhist perspective, not just water, just about everything is an emanation thing. And when we speak of things being emergent, then what it gives us a sense of is that things are not just the components of it, but something, something additional to it. Of course, not completely distinct from it in the sense of being separable, yet at the same time, not quite exactly those components themselves. But to take it a step further, of course, we can easily agree that yes, the whole thing is not the components. Now the now the problem is what about the comp what about the collection? And that too, not just mere collection, but a collection in a specifically arranged way. Because if the collection were to be the thing, if if the collection were to be the thing, if the collection of the parts, of course, we totally understand the parts themselves not being the whole. We all understand it. But what about the collection of it? Because, by the way, collection is nothing but the components put together in whatever arrangement it may be. But if that were to be the thing itself, then... then it loses, at least from my understanding, it loses uh, the very basis upon which we can speak of things being merely designated. Because if the thing itself is the collection of, collection of the past themselves, or the components, then it's, of course, yeah, then it is almost kind of suggesting that the thing is not just there, but from there sight, because of the collection, components having come together and having become a collection, the collection is still still what we have gathered together. Like when we build buildings, we, we collect materials, and we, we may bring them individually, but when we put them together, that's all what we really brought. And if that is the building, then that we did bring building from our side. I don't know if this is making any sense or not. <laughs> so the scripture takes a, takes great, if I may say, it goes in great length in refuting the mere, the not just mere collection. I'm just not saying mere collection in the sense of just putting together all this together with no particular functionality or no particular arrangements, working arrangement, functional arrangement, but rather collection with a specific arrangement. So the scriptures go in great length in refuting, of course by resorting to scriptural authorities, but also by using reasoning in refuting why the collection is not the thing itself. The thing is always not just more than the parts, but even more than the collection. If we could establish this, then this, then this moreness of things, then the mere, then the collection, then the parts, kind of brings us closer to accepting that yes, all everything that we bring together, when we have a, when we have a, when we have a composite. Uh, thing, a whole, a whole composer, whole of those components brought together. If we can make the case that just about everything that we point our fingers to is in relation to its own composite parts and the collection of it is like an emergent thing, is like a is like greater than it, then there's the prospect of making the case that yes, things are mere designated. One could begin to see a designation or the, the room for proposing that things 
are not just dependent on causes, conditions, not just dependent on the parts, but things indeed are dependent on a subjective agent. And that is not just subject, they're not just confined to things like person, sentient beings, where because of the presence of consciousness as part of those components, the one who possesses it becomes automatically becomes something outside of it, something other than it, something non-consciousness, non-components. But when we think of non-inanimate things like books and whatnot, and we think of it being more than the collection, then it makes us think of, uh, of what it is in relation to the components and also, also as the and also the collection. So, so that uh, am I making sense? Pardon? Yes, yes. Pardon? Yes and yes and no. <laughs> oh, okay, that's good. Um, so, kind of back to the earlier part. For could you give an example, like say, if you were doing looking at the collection of parts of a car or a chariot, when when would the not finding the conventional analysis? When would it be ultimate analysis? Because it sounds like you can do that. You could look at that either way. How would you know? You know, one one not finding would be you were saying would be conventional analysis, yes. the other not finding would be ultimate analysis. Mm -hmm. So could you kind of play out what each of those would look like? So what I'm speaking of as conventional, unfinding in the conventional sense, when, when, when investigated upon, when searched for, it is just looking through the parts and seeing that there is no car anywhere, anywhere, anywhere in it. Okay. Yeah. No, not casual. I mean, you just look into it the same way. You look into the car and the components and then tease them apart or point them at each one of them, and none of them turns out to be the car. Now the problem, now the question there is, what about the collection of it in that particular way of arranging it? So even from a conventional sense, even even from a conventional sense, I mean, the and the refuting the collection to be the car, even that is still within the conventional realm, conventional sense. Now the question is, what would be the ultimate way? Not just not finding it there, but seeing that there is no car. There's no car that exists from the parts, from the collection. But there's a big component that goes from here. It's not just by putting them together, right? But not just by putting them together, that, that, that all, that's all about what car is. A big component of it is the projection. And when we bring this projection part of it, then we can talk of its opposite, uh, what do you call, object of, object of negation, the opposite of it, which is existing from there. So that's the reason why we speak of how making or harmonizing, bringing a harmony between dependent arising and emptiness is so hard. Yes. So it sounds like refuting things in the ultimate sense really involves understanding the role of the mind, whereas the conventional refutation is just parts. There's no... Um, you know, the mind is not one of the conditions for the arising of the conventional car. Well, 
<laughs> what I'm saying is the nature of the investigation, the nature of the investigation. When we take things apart and do not find it, that is unfinding, not finding it in the conventional sense. That non-findability is not quite the emptiness of things, and it is very easy to understand also. But the, and, and yes, that kind of research doesn't necessarily make us wonder about what the role of the consciousness is. Nor does that kind of unfindability, once we land there, makes us necessarily makes us think that the thing doesn't exist from it, except that it is not there. Although it may seem very, very similar, but there's a big difference. So, when we... So, in this respect, in this respect, the part about positing everything as being almost like an emergent quality of its collections, of the parts and the collection thereof, that plays a big role because that helps in placing everything, or that helps in not placing, that helps in seeing everything almost in a similar light, like we find self. In, in relation to the mind-body as parts and mind-body as a comp composite. Because mind-body as a composite is still, still not, not something outside of it, still within the realm of mind and body, which both of them and together is not the self. Yes. Okay. Can we say that doing that kind of analysis, that is the conventional kind, is a doorway or a pathway to going to the more subtle understanding, or is it completely off the mark? No, no, that's not completely off the oh, mark. Oh, it is not, I wouldn't say it is on the right track, but it is, uh, it, it helps. It helps in making us wonder how things actually might exist. Because you're not looking for something, you are looking for car in, in, the, in the composite, but not really questioning whether a big part, or rather a significant part of the carness came from a subjective side. That part is not necessarily questioned. Because when we question that, then it's it's corresponding. It's, it's corresponding. What do you call? It's corresponding opponent that of think, things coming from their side would be then. Uh, what do you call? Approached or will be will be then uh, encountered. Will be will be kind of looked into. So, any, 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 anyway, uh, the part, the, 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 the proposition that I make that everything is, including not just person. Person in, in the case of person, last last time we saw how person, as opposed to other things, is a more, uh, more convenient topic to understand emptiness as opposed to other phenomena such as our aggregates and whatnot. Not because their emptinesses are are different in terms of subtlety or grossness, but by virtue of what 
happens to be the basis of that emptiness. There's this, there's this, uh, uh, there's this case of one being easier to access, the other being more difficult to access. Not because they are different in being sat- more subtle and less less subtle. Because of the fact that the person is neither the body nor the mind, not the collection of it, but it is something additional to it. Because from the very definition of a person, or, or the class that we put persons in, from among the compounded phenomena, within the in in the light of the three classifications of consciousness, form, and the what they call derivative, what they call the abstract. Pardon? Abstract. Yeah, at the abstract composite, because of its abstractness itself, it lends its uh, a special, it lends itself as a more more easier basis to approach it. Not that its its emptiness is any less subtle than other things. But what I'm making a case here is, although on the surface it looks like, yes, there's a world apart in, world apart in terms of what a book is or what a person is, because of, it's because of the presence of consciousness as, um, as among its components, and that it makes a big difference. Yes, there's a difference in terms of how it ap- appears to us, or what it, its apparent uh, notion is to us. And because of that, it makes one an easier access, easier base, easier base to access emptiness and other not. Yet at the same time, in terms of uh, anything being almost like an abstract in relation to its components and the collection thereof, uh, there is no difference. So that's what I'm making the case of. In that respect, I'm pushing this idea that everything is looked from one perspective, emergent property with regard to its components and the collection they are. And that's not just what I'm making, but what I see the scriptures also making a case of by saying that it's not just that the components are not the thing, but even the collection of that in this particular arranged form is also not the thing. Yeah, there are many reasonings presented in the scripture, but we have already touched on uh, very vague, abstract <laughs> thing for, for some time. So I think uh, maybe sometime later when we bring it up for discussion so I can share it. So definitely it is not resorting to this reasoning that if you if the collection were to be the thing, then it just you just be bring the collection in a in a jungle jumbled way and then they 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 would be the thing. That's one reasoning, but that's not everything. That's that's not everything. Yes, yes, please. Uh, you know, when we're taught the four point analysis, yeah, they never really. Which which four points? Uh, Self, other. Uh, first. Um, no. no. Yeah, you first find the optic. You first have to decide it's. I see. I see. I see. Identify it as either separate or just separate. Yeah, yeah. Identify the object of negation. Then you have to decide it's either part of this or not part of this. And then you look inside, and then you look outside. And don't find it. I don't think inside and outside is any part of that. Is it? It's either. Separate. It's either yeah, one or separate. Yeah, one or separate. So yeah, but one. in in part, outside, outside part is very important yeah. to 
understand that it is not. Because if things were to be inherently existent, it, it is not binding for it to be either inside or outside. But if things were to be inherently existent, it is binding for it to be either inherently one or inherently other, because there is no other way outside that. But it is not binding for anything to be inherently existent, to be existing inside or outside or above or low. There is no binding connection there. Mm. Well, maybe it's the way I use the words. Yeah. But anyway, if one or one with or separate from, would that be more correct? Yeah, but there it has to be qualified. It has to be qualified because if one were to just merely subject it, subject it to an investigation along the line of one and separate, and within the conventional, then it would be either of them. There's no no way the things can be none of them, neither of them. It has to be one of them. But when you qualify it as inherently one or two, inherently one or inherently separate, not only it is so comprehensive, yet at the same time you cannot find anything that is either of them, let alone common locus, but either of them. Inherently one or inherently separate. Yes. That's exactly the qualifier that has to go okay. with it when we present it as a uh, as a reasoning for uh, reasoning in the ultimate sense. Okay, thank you. Now I can ask my questions. Yes. <laughs> so, when you're doing that analysis and you're trying to see if the self is inherently one or inherently separate from, from the body. The, Yes. Yeah. Um, with what you're saying tonight, it seems like it would be part of that to look at the subjective side of this, but I've never heard that. Stuff. Not subjective side at that point. What you are aiming at is its opponent. What would be what it would be if it were not to be subjective side and rejecting it. Thus, leaving with no other option but to be then endorsing the subjective part. It comes later in terms of ascertainment. Of course, one could wonder, one could employ it, one could use that approach bef while one is struggling with the understanding. But such an as affirmation, assertion about the subjective component will not be complete without first having refuted fully the objective side of it. But at the same time, when one is pursuing the understanding, yes, one can, what do you call, uh, switch between the both and try to, what do you call, enhance one's understanding in both of them. But in terms of ascertaining that, yes, it is purely subjectively designated, it has to be first preceded by having totally ruled out the objective reality. Because even in the... If, uh, okay, maybe I have said it uh, slightly unclear. When you say that uh, the understanding of things being subjectively designated, uh, such an understanding to be thorough has to be qualified with merely designated. So that mere designated part of it, that sure, thorough, what do you call, comprehensive aspect of it can never be have, can never come about without having first, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes. So it sounds like for it to be ultimate analysis, there has to be a clear understanding of the object of negation first thing, seeing very clear that um, negating what appears to be objectively existent, where if the conventional analysis is just looking at an object, not paying, not having an object of negation there, just seeing a, an, ob uh, 
yeah, this like everyday object or and that distinction between when looking at the self, that's like, oh, you know, I'm here, I've got no affliction, I'm not grasping at anything. But negating the everyday I'm walking, I'm eating, I'm sleeping self, that's not the object, but it's that solidified sense of me from its own side. So to make anything conventional analysis, we have to be very clear of the object of negation first. Is that right? Can you say it again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. One more time. One more time. Yeah. To make things ultimate analysis, uh -huh. you have to be very clear of the object of negation first, that something um, appears to be objectively existent uh -huh. without first establishing that object of negation that appears to be objectively existent, we would be negating conventional existence mm. and then run the risk of um, nihilism. Yeah, there is a struggle there. There is a struggle there. We have we we try our best in making some sense of the difference between the two uh, on broad senses on on broad lines. Uh, but at the same time, to expect a clear-cut distinction between the two beforehand is very difficult. Nonetheless, one has to have a, some gross, rough idea of what is and what is not, amounting to objective analysis or not. So, simply put, investigating in the conventional sense, yet still lending not lending to unfindability of it, it would be just looking through the parts and say there's not none of that none of them is the thing. But that is not emptiness. Yeah. That's not touching on the object of re object of negation. The object of negation it is quite but it is at the same time not completely what do you call not completely disconnected with our experience look at our experience particularly of our sight of our senses and whatnot to say that things do not exist from their sight would be would be too much uh, would be would be going almost against what actually is appearing to us so if you say yes, you that the things are because of projection, which would make it almost like come from the subjective sides, we would have difficulty agreeing with that. That's a clear indication that yes, we have a very strong projection or an appearance of things existing from their side. So from their side and being being there and being things being there outside of us and things appearing to exist from that side, there's a big difference. So when we mean to re re refute the objective reality, it's not like the Chitta Matras where they reject everything external to the mind. It's not like that. Yet at the same time, uh, yet at the same time, it is not... Yet at the same time, it is uh, not quite the exact object of negation that we are seeking to reject. So I, I don't know if I understood the question clearly or not. So, yeah, I kind of uh, just briefly mentioned about how th things are. So, so for now, what would be good to think about and reflect is the collection being not the thing. Everything is not the collection of its parts together. I mean, there's no question about it's not being the parts, components, but the collection. That too, not just any kind of a collection of its components, but collection in a particularly arranged way. Things being not that, that's something to think about. 
in the case of person, it is a little easier to understand. But in the case of other things, because we would be positing and uh, still maintaining that the book is a material thing, not like, not like, not like a person. The person by virtue is having consciousness among its components. It can be, pres- it can be easily, uh, what do you call, accepted as being uh, neither the consciousness nor the neither the consciousness itself, nor the other rest of the aggregates, and yet something linked, connected with them, but not quite them, either of them. But in the case of the book, yes, of course the book is none of its components, but it still is a material thing, but not the mere, not just mere collection, but not the collection in an arranged way, in a specifically arranged way. So that part is, once we understand, understand, or once we uh, get some hold on that, then, in my understanding, it opens up the prospect of seeing everything almost in the light of a person in relation to the, the aggregates, and thus bring home to closer the, the the possibility that yes, they are existing. By virtue of being, by virtue of being dependent on a projecting mind and the basis of designation. Yeah, that 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 part. And then yeah, I did say that uh, there are lines of reasoning to 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 present that, but uh, they are as abstract and not that easily easily. So I didn't want to add to the abstract part of it, and even more. But I'll keep this note, and then I'll be sharing it bit by bit. <laughs> but that part, I think, from my understanding, holds a big a big key in in making home the, the proposition that things are merely designated. Now the problem is, on the basis of things being nothing but mere designated, one should be able to account for their distinctness of their distinct capacities, functionalities, the world is really evolving and working, functioning on that basis. At the same time, nothing but mere designation. Which is not to rule out the, 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 the designation, designating component aspect of it being assisted in it by the basis of but very pieces of imputation. Uh, yet at the same time, the the main, in a way, if one were to weigh the percentage, the percentage, the more percentage of dependence or yeah, decision l- lies on the projecting mind. Okay, I think. <laughs> But at the same time, very important to think is that we're not speaking of how the, the designating mind is making everything function, making everything function. We are speaking of not how to make things, but how things, no matter how you make it, how you come about it, turns out, ends out to be nothing but merely projected. Of course, merely projecting doesn't create things. We have to make efforts, but no matter how we make efforts and whatnot, what we get, which we actually get and is functional, ends up nothing but being mere projection. But with you, the fact that they are not still, they are still not the collection of things. Not just collection, but bringing parts and building them in the way you do. You have it with a whole, but nonetheless, still it is merely projected. So that part, bringing the two, is like, Venerable Master Jin, who pointed out, bringing, harmonizing, dependent arising and emptiness. That's the crux. It's because if we go for dependent arising, it seems like we are proposing project uh, objectivity. But when you say things are mere designated, it's like saying, completely taking it away and saying that it's just mentally created. 
So being able to find functionality in this discreet way that we understand the world around within the within the within the schema of things being nothing but merely projected. Okay, I ended up spending the whole thing here on it and still not sharing some of the points about why the collection is, not just the mere collection, but collection in this particular way is not the thing. That's the very, I, know, I personally think it's very crack, very important. And the scriptures is not just something that I'm bringing by reading between the lines, but the scriptures themselves are, uh, what do you call, abounding in really making case for that. Okay. With that, <laughs> yes, uh, there is an announcement here. Uh, we will not have SNBN uh, on next Friday, May 26, because of the start of our Memorial Day retreat. Okay, I think that's it. <laughs>